Right. Yes, I've heard this is a trend across the country. They're, they, they're trying to actually infringe on people's constitutional rights from protesting. But you know what? Our right to protest is embedded in, in the Constitution. And that's what I mean about running for office. When you, when you have a voice in any state legislature or in a state or in a city council or a county commission, you can advocate for our right to protest. And it's not lost on me that we didn't draw the boundaries to our lands. So, right? And so, thank you, Ryan. So, when, when we are working to protect, just because our sacred sites aren't within the boundaries of our land doesn't mean that they cease to be our sacred sites. And it's our obligation to protect those sites. The same way that I am working hard to protect Chaco Canyon from fracking and drilling, you all have a right to protect your sacred lakes and rivers and mountains and various other lands where your people have prayed for centuries. So that's what I'm talking about. Thank you. You can clap for that. Thank you. So thank you for asking that question. And I, I think that that is exactly what I'm talking about. Our voices need to be heard in every single level of government. And um, you can bet that if any bill like that tries to come across the House floor, that I'll be the first one to speak up against it. Because that is our right. It's not only our right, it's our obligation. It are, it, it's our obligation to fight for those things. Anyone else? I'll take one more. Yes. The first thing, you sh if you live in Iowa, I think you should apply to Emerge Iowa. Get some training. Look, it's, everyone needs to get involved. I got involved. I started out as a phone volunteer, and now I'm a member of Congress. I'm, uh, that's the honest-to-God truth. Because, yes. I've, I wanted more Indians to vote. That was my mission in life for close to 20 years. I, I would go into campaign offices of candidates who I liked and ask for lists of Native Americans. And I would call those people and ask them to get out and vote. That turned into me uh, actually uh, going to Emerge New Mexico. Uh, it turned into me uh, being a full-time volunteer for President Obama's 2008 campaign. It turned into me being the uh, state Native American vote director for President Obama's campaign in 2012. So I want you all to get involved. I want you to start as a phone volunteer if you've never been involved in politics before and just make that move forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, Chairman. <laughs> Hi, President. Nice to see you all. Nice to see you. I guess that's my cue. <laughs> so I thank you all for your graciousness in giving me this opportunity to update you on my work in Congress. I'm honored and privileged to represent the First District of New Mexico and thrilled to work at giving all tribes a seat at the table. My door is always open to you. I'd like to now transition to putting on my organizer hat. You may know that I have worked on campaigns for several decades, during which time I dedicated much of my organizing career to getting out the native vote through phone calls, door knocking, and building trust for our party and Indian communities across my state. Considering that this 2020 election is the most important election of our lifetime, and I know that we say that every single year, but this truly is, we must win the White House if we intend to protect our democracy and our environment even into the near future. I decided to be bold and to put all of my experience and heart behind a candidate who I feel has the intelligence, the experience, the energy, enthusiasm, and the heart to win this election for working families, for students, for people of color, for our LGBTQ communities, for teachers and veterans, for Indian country, and everyone who has been sidelined by this administration. Let me share with you about my decision to endorse Elizabeth Warren for president.
For the past couple of years, I've had the opportunity to get to know Senator Warren personally. We have spoken often about the needs in Indian country, and she has taken action legislatively. She personally helped me get elected to Congress. We've worked together to introduce legislation calling for universal child care and pre-K and for suitable housing for our families. I've seen her up close conversing with tribal leaders and tribal youth, listening and asking the questions that move deep thought and ideas forward. Elizabeth's just released truly bold tribal plan is one that will give all tribes the executive attention they need and deserve and will move forward all the legislation I just talked about and more. But beyond all the great policy plans and intentions, we share perspectives in how we look at the world. We both come from humble beginnings and found success through hard work and perseverance. We both were single moms and we understand what it means to live paycheck to paycheck, struggling to make ends meet. And as a former state party chair, I know a winning candidate when I see one. One of my favorite things about Senator Warren is her ability to explain complicated plans and concepts into language that all of us can understand. She is genuine and warm, and she makes every moment count in her fight for working families. Some media folks have asked me whether the president's criticisms of her regarding her ancestral background will hamper her ability to convey a clear campaign message. I say that every time they ask about Elizabeth's family, instead of the issues of vital importance to Indian country, they feed the president's racism. Elizabeth knows she will be attacked, but she's here to be an unwavering partner in our struggle because that is what a leader does. I say the president who worships Andrew Jackson, who coddles white supremacists and defends Vladimir Putin, who cages children and freely admitted to assaulting women, is no match for a woman with a plan. I understand that throughout our history, our people were kidnapped, shipped off, assimilated, and adopted out as infants. Families and communities were separated, and sometimes lifetimes went by without them finding one another again. What I'm saying is, she has found us. I'm asking you to listen to her message. I'm asking you to join me in my mission for the Working Families Champion, the woman who doesn't walk but runs through train stations and airports, the fearless and persistent legislator, the defender of our environment, the friend to teachers and students alike, and beating the current occupant of the White House, she has a plan for that. And I'm proud to support and introduce the amazing, the unstoppable, my sister in the struggle, Senator Elizabeth Warren. Marcella LeBeau and Donna Brandis escorted Elizabeth Warren to the stage. Can I just say hello? Yes, good to hear. Good to see you. Hello. Good to see you. I won't just be hard. Good to see you. It's so nice to see you. Good to see you. Hello to everyone. <laughs> hello. I want to pay my respects. Uh, that's an extraordinary introduction. And I feel so um, cared for by the women who walk me out. Thank you very much. Uh, Deb, thank you for the generous introduction. Deb has been such a good partner and such a good friend. And I stand here and I see so many people I've had a chance to work with on issues like preventing suicide and missing and murdered indigenous women and trying to get full funding 
for health care and for housing. I see young leaders who come and talk to me about the new businesses they're starting on tribal lands, uh, graduates of our tribal colleges who have innovative ideas, uh, tribal leaders who remind me every day how much our tribes serve their citizens and their neighbors. The message I hear from Indian country is one of resilience and hope. Now, before I go any further in this, I want to say this. Like anyone who's being honest with themselves, I know that I have made mistakes. I am sorry for harm I have caused. I have listened and I have learned a lot. And I am grateful for the many conversations that we've had together. It is a great honor to be able to partner with Indian country. And that's what I've tried to do as a senator. And that's what I promise I will do as president of the United States of America. The federal government's history with our tribal nations has been one of broken promises. We need to make change. We need to honor our trust and treaty obligations to the native tribes. And we're not going to do that with one little statute over here and a couple of changes in regulations over there. It's going to take big structural change. That's how I see this. Think of it this way. Uh, full funding for housing, for health care, for education, for infrastructure, those are not optional. We need to change the rules and make it happen. Government to government relationship, that is not optional. We need to change the rules and make it happen. And missing and murdered indigenous women, to talk about particularly on this day, this is a crisis. And tribal sovereignty and full funding so that tribes can keep people safe is not an option. We need to change the rules and make it happen. <laughs> Big structural change. That's what Congresswoman Holland and I are fighting for. Big structural change so that everyone has a chance to build a strong future. Thank you for having me today. It's an honor to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is this my place? Where would you like me? You can wander or you can sit. No, no, I'll sit. I'll okay. sit. I don't want my back to people. Okay. Here we go. Thank you. Here we go. Thank you, Senator. We're going to start with a question from uh, Chairman White from the Winnebago Nation. Well, it's a, a special day, I feel. I just got a hug from the next president of the United States. <laughs> uh, Senator, this uh, uh, pertains to law enforcement. Yes. So the thing that I saw was that you finally documented that. exclusively federal and, and tribal, operate with less than 60% of the officers that the federal government's own studies show are necessary. We also have detention facilities that are in such bad condition, unreliable heat, water, air conditioning, bad ventilation, and cracking walls and leaky roofs, that they would not be allowed to operate anywhere else in the country. What steps are you prepared to take to address this crisis? So thank you very much for the question. I see this as having two parts to it. I think there is a sovereignty and respect part to this, and there's also just a plain old money part to it. We have got to be willing to put the resources in so that the tribal nations are able to keep their citizens safe. We just must. What I'd like to see us do is reverse Oliphant. 
I want to see the tribal nations able to protect all people on their territories, and that means jurisdiction over both tribal citizens and non-tribal citizens. And then we need to be willing to put the money in so the system works. It's not enough just to acknowledge sovereignty. We've got to put resources behind it so that law enforcement has what it needs to be able to get the job done, so that the judicial system has what it needs to be able to operate the courts. So I see this as moving forward on both grounds. It's the importance of our recognizing the sovereignty of the tribal nations and the nation-to-nation -nation relationship between the federal government and the tribal nations, and it's about putting the money in to honor our trust and treaty obligations. We'll go to Shannon Halsley from Stark Ridge Muncie. Thank you, Senator Warren. I especially appreciated your um, platform on what you're going to do. It seems you really have the pulse on Native Americans and the necessary things that we need in order to exercise our sovereignty within our respective nations. I also appreciate the fact that you said that you are going to appoint somebody to come and um, deal directly with Native Americans because as a tribal leader, it's extremely frustrating as we navigate every cycle of um, elections. It's, as Native Americans, you oftentimes have to go in and educate uh, new administrations around the issues that relate to Native Americans and the unique uh, sovereign status that they share and the government-to-government -government relationship that they do. My question is about cr criminal justice and policing, and you spoke of it earlier in your recognition of missing and murdered indigenous we um, yes. people, women, and I don't want to sort of belabor over it, but some of the statistics according to the United States Department of Justice are that American Indian women are 10 times more likely to be murdered than the national average, and also four in five American Indian women will experience violence in their lifetimes. And homicide is the third leading cause of death for American Indian girls between the ages of 10 and 24. And as you'd spoken of earlier, the crisis has been long a quiet one. And we, as indigenous women and children, have become virtually um, invisible within the landscape of America. So my question is, is as it relates to those things, um, as federal authorities, quite honestly, um, fail to really accurately report those things and work to not only um, advocate on our behalf and seek justice for those women and those m m and resources, as the President of the United States, how would you enjoin not only yourself but your administration and your authority to address the missing and murdered indigenous women in a crisis in Indian country? So, thank you for the question. This comes on the day. That is two years to the day, I believe, that Savannah was taken. And when I first got to Congress, uh, the Violence Against Women Act was up for reauthorization. And I was one of the strong supporters of expanding VAWA to include indigenous women and specific provisions and specific resources for that. As you know, though, Bill has now been allowed to lapse. This is something we've got to be pushing back on and make sure that it has adequate and expanded protection over where we got it the last time. The other part, though, that I, I very much hear you talking about is the invisibility of the problem. That um, over and over, I'm struck by women who go missing and it doesn't make a headline for a week for a month, women who are murdered, Native women. And it never makes a headline. A problem that is not seen is a problem that is not fixed. So I think of this in two ways. One is the importance of the federal government getting serious about collecting data and making those data publicly available. People need to know the scope of this problem. But the other part is to go back to the issue about tribal sovereignty, about Oliphant, why it is that we need the tribal nations on the front lines 
adequately resourced so that they can provide the first line of defense. It is powerfully important that people who are of the community, people who know, are right there to provide the safety and the security that our women, our children, our men need. So I think it's both that we go for and that we start now by raising this issue every day. And I just want to say again, you were kind enough to say thank you to me. I want to say thank you again to Deb Holland as we, her work in this area has been extraordinary. And she has forced our Congress to address issues that they have ignored. Thank you. And thank you for your work in this area. Together, we're going to make change. Thank you. Let's turn to David Fickey, Koshada Tribe. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to share the stage with uh, um, colleagues and, and tribal leaders. It's a huge honor to be with you today, uh, uh, Mrs. Warren. Oh, thank you. Um, Satya Yukpaho is on behalf of the Koshara tribe of Louisiana. Um, Satya Yukpaho is Yamos and Itanaka. Yamos and Hitler Yukuk, Satya Yukpaho is Yamit Itanaka, Fagil Gumula, Adul, Kami Mukub. Kosnaluk, Nati Gilgub, Atinasa, Kominati, Kulomukub. Glad to be here that uh, if we don't speak, for ourselves yes. as Native people, no one will speak for us. Today, this morning, I'm very proud to be wearing, literally on, on myself, um, a quote from a tribal elder from 1973 when the Kushadas achieved its federal re-recognition from the United States government. I'm wearing a quote which says, the struggle has made us stronger. And that elder is still alive, and he's watching this morning from Elton, Louisiana, and his name is Ernest Sicky. Good morning, Dad. Good morning, Dad. This says it all for all Native people, in my opinion. But as a proud American, I'm proud to say that this quote speaks for all people around this country. How many struggles have we all overcome as Americans? How far have we come as American people and as a country? And Mrs. Warren, we have so much more to go. And it's not very often that we as Native people come across friends and allies of Native people, and sometimes at great expense to candidates and non-Indians, they partner with us at immense political risk to you, perhaps. But here you're sharing the stage. It's a wonderful day, and Native Americans across this country should celebrate a day today that we're sharing the stage with a future president, perhaps. <laughs> I would expect more excitement from our Native citizens. <laughs> but, uh, where is your destination? Where are you headed, Mrs. Warren? To You'll the White House. <laughs> <laughs> Milwaukee is Algonquin mm -hmm. for the good land. Yes. And you'll be headed there soon, in the near future, for the Democratic National Convention, to have good discussions and good conversations. And we hope that you take our message with you and promote it on the national platform. The very question that I ask as a tribal leader in my own tribe is that who will protect, defend, honor, and enhance the best interests of this country's native citizens? Because you know what? We deserve it. And the United States government is obligated. Yes. Native Americans across this country would like to talk about reconstruction. Reconstruction. Because as we stand now, $2.5 billion is what the annual budget is for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. 
to be distributed among 573 federally recognized tribes. That is unacceptable yes, and shameful. And we have let this country's native peoples down. We owe so much to our elders, our predecessors, our current generation, and future generations of the unborn. <laughs> Harvard University, which you're all familiar with. <laughs> George C. Marshall spoke at Harvard. And he said at one time during that speech, our policy is not directed against any country, but against hunger, poverty, desperation, and chaos. How many Native Americans face that at your reservations? Raise your hand. How many of these things sound familiar to you? Again, it's extremely shameful. In 1948, the United States implemented the Marshall Plan. The plan was in effect until 1951. Over the course of this period, including aid provided prior to the start of the Marshall Plan, the U.S. invested just shy of $1 trillion in current dollar value in economic and technical assistance to European nations post the damage caused during the war. While these efforts addressed post-war recovery, they equally included efforts to modernize European infrastructure. And the efforts served to create an atmosphere of hope that would lead to greater strength and prosperity. Mrs. Warren, you have spoken passionately about the issues of reparations and how it is a moral imperative. However, to date, none of the 2020 candidates have raised the issue of reconstruction for Indian country. The United States commits billions of dollars to reconstruction in countries it has waged war upon. The last being Afghanistan and Iraq. In respect to military conflict, the United States was engaged with the great Sioux Nation for 36 years, twice as long as the current conflict in Afghanistan. That is but one example of many. The economies and vital infrastructure of tribal nations subject to war with the U.S. were either destroyed or devastated. And yet not one dollar has been invested in reconstruction of these tribal nations by the U.S. As president, would you commit to a reconstruction program to rebuild Indian country and redress a historical wrong? So thank you for the question and thank you for the way you frame this. You know, I look at this as show me your budget and I'll tell you your values. Where a country spends its money tells you what that country values. One of the reasons that Deb and I put right at the heart of our plan is full funding for infrastructure, for education, for health on our tribal lands is that we understand that until the United States honors its already existing trust and treaty obligations, that we cannot have the kind of prosperity among the tribal nations that they deserve. So we start there. And I think what I would like to see, and I hope, I hope this is the right way to think about it, and I, we've stayed very open textured in how we've We've addressed our plan. We've not yet gone to statutory language because we invite much more conversation from our tribal leaders, from the intertribal organizations, uh, from experts and young people who want to come in and tell us about different parts of the language. But here's where I'd like to start. I would like to start with the United States government honoring its current trust and treaty obligations in full. <laughs> And see how far that gets us. If I can, I just want to add one more small point, because it's something else that Deb and I have worked on together. And that is about bigger programs and plans that will reach a lot of people. They're not specific to Indian country, but would have a profound effect. I've proposed a tax, a two-cent tax, 
on the greatest fortunes in this country. It's a wealth tax, the top one-tenth of one percent. And with that two cents, we can fund childcare for every baby in this country age zero to five. That means money straight down into our tribal nations to be able to offer this care for every one of their children, paid for by the federal government. Universal pre-K for every three-year-old and four-year-old in this country, raising the wages of every child care worker and preschool teacher in this country. These are the things we do and should be doing together. And I'll just add, because it gives you an idea of how distorted our economy has come, become, that same two cents will not only do all of that for our babies, it will permit us to provide technical school, community college, four-year college, all of our tribal colleges, tuition-free, expand the Pell Grants for the people who most need them, put $50 billion into our historically black colleges and universities, minority-serving institutions and tribal colleges, and cancel student loan debt for 95% of the folks who've got it. This gives people a lot of educational opportunities and also means for people struggling now with student loan debt, we can cancel that student loan debt and that's gonna make it easier for a lot of people to be able to move back to the reservation, be able to move back to small towns in rural America. You ought to be able to make it wherever you live in America. And part of that is about the United States government honoring its promises. That's where I am on this. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Thank you. Next question is Aaron Payment from Susan Marie. Ani Buju, Biwaka Jigandish Nakas, Makwa Migizi and Dodam, Bawating and Donjaba, Nishnabe, Ojibwe, Odawa, Otawatami and Dow. I serve as the president of the United Tribes of Michigan, uh, vice president for Midwest Alliance of Sovereign Tribes, and first vice president for the National Congress of American Indians, in addition to being chairperson of the Sault Ste. Marie Tribe of Chippewa Indians. <laughs> I, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you um, immediately after you were elected. Um, you've always been a friend to Indian Country, and you came to our NCI Executive Winter Session yes. reception, and I've seen you there every year since. Um, so you have supported Indian Country not just because you're running for uh, election uh, for president, but you've been around um, since you've been uh, elected. So I appreciate thank you. that. And thank you for the warm welcome you've always given me. I appreciate it. Um, and so we did, we had a conversation um, at that reception and you told me, I asked you a little bit about your personal history because of the attacks uh, during the campaign by that, uh, that centerfold guy that you ran against. And I don't remember his name anymore, Scott Brown maybe or something. And you told me your personal story in a very personal level and, and I, I urged you to tell your story and I appreciate that you did. And um, what I would say is, uh, from here forward, because now we're in a presidential election, that we take uh, Michelle Obama's advice, and when, when he goes low, you go high, and when he attacks in a racist way, disparaging one of our heroes, one of our female Indian hero women in our country, that you take the option not to give any um, credence to his, his racist arguments, but instead, Tell us what you're going to do for us. The cabinet position that you've proposed is amazing. That's history in the making. I appreciate yep. that. <laughs> President Obama got the ball rolling with the annual tribal leader conference. I would ask that you change that to tribal leader summit. We have not had one since the current presidents occupied the White House. So I'm, I'm excited about the leadership that you're gonna to bring to the White House and the government to government relationship that I know you will, uh, you will um, institutionalize for tribes. Natural resources extraction on tribal land, on treaty lands, threatened sacred sites, cultural resources, tribal sovereignty, and the environment. The health of entire tribal communities suffers when outside companies extract precious resources from tribal communities and in turn share none of the profits. Uh, tribes are forced to shoulder the risk of the disaster but share in none of the wealth. Tribal lands are treated as wastelands for industrial mining, uranium mining, fracking, and pipelines. 
How will your administration ensure tribal governments are consulted and tribal leaders exercise authority over all natural resource extraction in tribal nations? Thank you. Thank you for the question. So let me start by saying tribal governments are the ones who should control what happens on tribal lands. That's what it means, a government-to-government -government relationship. The second part, I will revoke the permit for the pipelines. Shouldn't have been granted the first time. But the third part is, again, to think about structural change, not just where we make one difference because we must. The pipeline permit should not have been issued in the first place. We can revoke that and straighten it out, but much better not to make mistakes to begin with. So here's what I want to do differently. I want to say on all federal lands, all lands near tribal reservation lands, that it is the tribes who are not just consulted, but who actually have to make an informed decision. And they are decision makers before the federal government goes forward with actions on other federal lands. Okay. Good. Cheryl Andrews Malte from Wampanoag. Yes, thank you. Um, Senator Warren. Oh, Elizabeth. <laughs> Madam President. Uh. <laughs> What a sound, isn't that? Oh, thank you. Um, I am fortunate that Senator Warren is my senator from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and she's been a staunch champion of Indian country. Her track record speaks for itself. Uh, she has either sponsored, co-sponsored, or supported and signed on to so many bills that are advantageous to Indian country that supports Indian country's sovereignty, that supports our initiatives, and we are very fortunate to have her in our corner as it is, but it would be far more advantageous for Indian country to have her as this next president of the United States. Thank you. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. With that being said, my issue is more along the lines of sovereignty and trust and treaty responsibility, and tribal lands in, in particular. Tribal lands are the cornerstone of the foundations of our countries, yes. in our Indian country, our communities, our family, and our future. Without tribal lands, we are unable to have housing, we, uh, diminishes our culture and our traditions, and it doesn't provide for socioeconomic advancement and self-sufficiency. So what we wanted to do was find out with the United States trust um, obligations and treaty responsibilities, as president, how do you plan to fulfill the federal obligation of trust and treaty responsibility and uphold those obligations for Indian country? So thank you for the question. I think this goes to what we've been talking about all morning, and that is the government-to-government -government relationship between the federal government and the tribal nations. And that's a true resetting of the relationship. It is there in words but not in action. The difference is that we need to change the rules to make sure it is there in action as well. I can do part of that from the White House. There is much, oh, I love saying this, that a president can do by herself. <laughs> and I commit to do that. Um, but there is also much that we have to work with Congress on. And this is why I'm so excited about the work that I'm doing with Congresswoman Holland and why it's so important that she's there. Undertaking this issue with each of our colleagues, holding them accountable, forcing them to vote over and over and over on issues that address this basic nation-to-nation -nation relationship. Thank you. This is how we work together. <laughs> the importance of land and the importance of land as a piece of both autonomy, history, and respect. And so I strongly, we've, we've been in these battles side by side, protect and as president will protect the, tri the lands that belong to the tribal nations. We're going to do that. Thank you. Harvey Godwin from Lumbee Tribe. 
So I'm Harvey Godwin, chairman of the Lumbee Tribe from North Carolina, and um, it's southeastern and it's rural, and yeah. And uh, we've been through two hurricanes in the last three years and still recovering from that. But today I'd like to talk to you about something a little bit different. The Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina receives funding through the Native American Housing and Self-Determining Act, known as NAHASDA under HUD. In 2008, the Housing and Urban Development Veterans Affairs Supportive Housing Program was initiated called HUD VASH. Mm -hmm. The Lumbee Tribe was awarded 20 HUD VASH vouchers as a part of our tribal HUD VASH demonstration program to provide housing to American Indian veterans living in our territory who are homeless or at risk of being homeless. As of today, with the collaboration between the Lumbee Tribe Veterans Affairs Office and the Veterans Administration in Fayetteville, North Carolina, which is home to Fort Bragg and the 82nd Airborne, the tribe has housed 20 Lumbee and other native homeless veterans with a waiting list of 22 more. We are awaiting ad additional vouchers through HUD. So Senator Warren, what can you currently do in Congress or what would you do as the President of the United States of America to fully fund and push through the Congress the needed funds to ensure that not one Native American is without dignified housing as Native American veterans. So, thank you. Now, this question you raise is one that is very close to me personally. All three of my brothers served in the military. My oldest brother was career military. The other two served and then came out one more construction after. One started a little business when it didn't work out, started another one. My three brothers I'm still very close to, they all live back in Oklahoma now. And I don't think there's a phone conversation or visit that goes by that one of the other of them doesn't raise the issue of how our government treats its veterans. Our veterans, our, our military, active duty military, have agreed to lay down their lives for us. Their families sacrifice enormously. I can still remember when I was just a little girl and my mother every day would run to the mailbox to see if there was a letter there from Don Reed, one from John, maybe one from David. And on the days when there were no letters from any of the boys, she'd say, well, maybe tomorrow, maybe tomorrow. And on days when there were letters, lit up the family lines, called everybody, read the letter, read it again. She met my daddy at the edge of the front yard, got a letter today from one of the boys. When people sign up for military service and agree to give up so much, that's a sacred promise with the United States government. And that means we have to honor our promises to our veterans, our promises for health care, our promises for education.